This is CBC Here and Now. She always had a really kind heart. More gut-wrenching stories about murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. She made sure that the time we have with her was special. We do have a legal duty for your safety. Public payout. A killer gets a settlement from the province. This snow that's on top, it breaks away. And how to survive going through the ice. A pretty nice Friday shaping up for most of us, but for the weekend, travel plans will be impacted. There's snow on the way. The timeline and the details are coming up. Let's get to our top story. The murder of women in this province has had a lasting impact on friends and families. Today, the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls heard what it's like to lose a mother or a daughter. Here and now's Peter Cowan is live now from Happy Valley Goose Bay. Peter, what message did they have for the inquiry? Anthony, in many ways, these are two very different stories. One person lost a mother, the other a daughter. For one, it happened in Nain, the other in St. John's at the other end of the province. But they both shared similar stories today about the lasting impact that these deaths have had on their lives. For example, Rudy Lamp talked about losing her daughter, Kimberly Girarsi, who was killed in 2010. And Lucas Abel was sentenced to seven years in prison in her death. He's since been released and is living in St. John's. But for Lamp, the impact of losing the daughter has lasted way longer than the sentence for Abel. Today, it's been uh, eight long years on January 12 since she's gone. Um, and we've had to learn uh, uh, to live um, a whole new reality without her. Um, especially myself and my daughter and uh, my granddaughter, Kira. Now, Amina Evans Harlick spoke to the inquiry today. She's from St. John's. Her mother was originally from Northwest River, not far from here, but was adopted as a baby and grew up in St. John's. She was killed in 2002 when Amina was only six years old. It wasn't until later in life that she learned exactly what happened to her mother, and that's had an impact on her because even though the man who killed her mother is still in prison, she finds at times being worried, having to look over her shoulder, wondering, whether or not he'll eventually come after her. I thought that he would end up killing me as well. I remember being really scared and that has stuck with me since that day. And I wish things were different because I, I don't want to feel that scared. I don't want to feel like on high alert all the time. <laughs> Inquiry is wrapping up as we speak right now, and this is the only stop that it's expected to be here in Newfoundland and Labrador. The next stop for the inquiry will be to move to Montreal, and we'll have to see when that final report comes out. The timing of that, a little unclear at this point. The federal government has been asked for a two-year extension before they take what they've heard here along with everything else in the country. Reporting live from Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Peter Cowan for Here and Now. The emotional day of testimony began by recognizing the strength of women. Before the inquiry got underway this morning, a performance of the First Nations song called Strong Women's Song, and that marked International Women's Day. In St. John's, an event to mark International Women's Day brought together women from the local business world. They reflected on the past year and looked ahead to the future. Here and now's Carolyn Stokes was there. Looking around this room, you see dozens and dozens of entrepreneurs, women who are here to celebrate all the progress this year has brought, but also feel so much more is left to be done. I asked them what International Women's Day means to them. In a word, dignity. I think camaraderie. I mean, if you look around the room here today, you know, there's, there are so many people, so, well, so many amazing women. I actually was joking, like, who's running the province today? Because they're all here. International Women's Day for me means believing in the next generation. I would say celebration. What I love about this day is that so many people are celebrating women, they're heroes, and who inspires them, and all the things that women accomplish in our community. So for me, even though there's so many issues to address, it's also a day for celebration. Empowerment. 
even though we've seen some challenges and there's been some eyebrow raising moments in the last year, I think in the end we will all be better for it because it, it's an opportunity and an avenue for women to put up their hands and have a voice. Necessary. Energizing. Not done yet. The time is now for us to contribute. The time is now for us uh, to participate. And we're just going to make it happen. My one word would be action. It's time for people to really take action, move things forward. No more complacency. Enough is enough. Keep awareness top of mind, not just on this one day, International Women's Day, but throughout the year because we need to make progress a lot more quickly. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, St. John's. Dozens of people are lining up for more than an hour to get drinking water from a roadside spring in Stephenville. The popular spot attracts thirsty people from all over the port of port Peninsula. They say the water is pristine, but as here and now's Colleen Connors reports, the government doesn't see it that way. Water gushes from this black pipe all day long. It's very, very nice, very good. Everybody comes here. The Gessos drive 45 minutes to get to this spring water on the Hanson Highway in Stephenville. It's so cold and it's so f this is the spring water and the, uh, it got no chlorine in it. Okay. The natural. And what's it like to drink? It's I mean, very good. It got um, no limestone. Your father the kettle don't have no limestone. Oh, so it doesn't leave any uh, stains behind? Nothing right? in the kettle, no. Oh, okay. Dozens line up to fill buckets with what they say is runoff water from a nearby well. This guy here got a really artesian mill. Okay. And it's come from the artesian mill. It's an overflow. People living in Stephenville wait up to an hour in line for this water. They love it compared to the tap water. They say that tastes gross, but the town doesn't agree. If you look at our water quality from our taps, it is clear, it is pristine, and it is safe. The mayor says Stephenville has one of the best systems in the country. Our water systems are tested, and we have checks and balances, quality control. Uh, we use the latest technologies. Uh, to ensure that the water going out to the residents of Stephenville is really good. The water in Stephenville comes from an artesian well system. It's high in calcium and tested on a regular basis. The mayor encourages the public to stop drinking from the roadside spring. Well, right now behind me, as you can see, there's a line of cars waiting to fill up their empty jugs from this water at this roadside spring. Now, the provincial government and the Department of Health says water from these roadside springs across the province are not fit to drink. They're not regulated and they're not tested. They say the best water to drink is the treated water that comes out of the tap. Colleen Connors, CBC News, Stephenville. A convicted killer is $45,000 richer tonight. Kenny Green has been awarded a settlement from the provincial government. It comes two years after Green sued over a violent riot at Her Majesty's Penitentiary. Here now is Arianna Kelland has our story. When these inmates filed into the chapel, they weren't here to pray. Instead, they were waiting to unleash a violent attack on Kenny Green. They tried to cover it up unsuccessfully, revealing a brutal pylon, a suspected retaliation attack for the death of a man Green killed the year before. It was a threat that both Kenny Green and correctional officials knew about beforehand. That was 2014. Two years later, after Kenny Green left the penitentiary, he lawyered up and sued the province. He alleged correctional officers here knew a threat was coming two days in advance, but did nothing to stop it. To counter that, the province says Kenny Green knew too about the threat, but still went to Sunday service. Now the two parties have reached a settlement, with Green awarded $45,000. Regardless of who you are, if you're within the, uh, you know, one of our institutions, one of our buildings, uh, we do have a legal duty for your safety. And in this case, uh, it was felt that a settlement was much better than going through court and possibly costing the taxpayers significantly more. Parsons says he understands the public may not like the settlement, but says it was for the best. Kenny Green has served his time in a federal prison. Neither he or his lawyer are talking tonight. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. Negotiations between the province and QP are at a standstill. Finance Minister Tom Osborne says there's what he calls a pause in the talks. The sticking point, he wants QP to agree to the same no-layoff deal that NAEP did. What I can say is that we are looking for the same assurance um, from QP that we had from NAEP on, on uh, that clause, and as well as uh, the 
uh, the public-private partnership costs. No taxis on Patty's Day? A group representing cab drivers says its members are prepared to stay home on the busiest day of the year. The issue is an insurance rate hike that came into effect this month. The Alliance of Taxi Operators says drivers are being squeezed out of business and wants the province to step in. Taxi drivers recently held a protest at Confederation Building, but to no avail. Now, it says unless rates are rolled back, Taxi Alliance members will refuse to drive on Monday morning. If that action is unsuccessful, then it will take aim at St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day is by far the busiest day of the year. It, it, it's even greater than New Year's Eve. Do you expect that all the taxis in St. John's are going to go along with this stuff? Well. If you own your own car and you operate with a major company, the major companies have all agreed that there will be no taxi service if we don't have a successful meeting with the government. But you get when you go, it's all against the government. Meanwhile, taxis in St. John's got a rough ride from the RNC today. Many cabs were hit with a surprise inspection blitz at the Village Mall and at the St. John's Airport. The Taxi Alliance called it payback for the insurance protests and accused the provincial government of ordering the inspections. Justice Minister Andrew Parsons laughed off the suggestion. The RNC says the taxi inspections were long planned and not related to the insurance issue, but an RNC spokesperson acknowledged the timing could have been better. The federal government is defending the way it reawarded a controversial surf clam quota. DFO took 25% of it from Clearwater and gave it to Nova Scotia-based Premium Seafoods and an unknown coalition of First Nations. A fish plant in Grand Bank processes most of those clams. With such a big hit to a lucrative fishery, Clearwater is now threatening legal action. Uh, and if a company doesn't own in perpetuity a quota, Canadians do. The word expropriation, I understand, is, is loaded language. It's designed to make a point, but a point that's not entirely accurate. Because you can't be expropriated from a property you don't own. Uh, and, and with respect, uh, uh, with respect to the legal action, I took note of their news release and Canadians are entitled to go to the, the courts and tell their story, so I respect that and I'm not surprised or worried about that. They're supposed to be an Indigenous partner in this province as required by the license, but just who that group is remains a mystery. Canadian metal workers are celebrating tonight. U.S. President Donald Trump is imposing new tariffs on steel and aluminum, but they won't apply to Canada or Mexico for now. Due to the unique nature of our relationship with Canada and Mexico, we're negotiating right now NAFTA. And we're going to hold off the tariff on those two countries to see whether or not we're able to make the deal on NAFTA. National security, very important aspect of that deal. Trump says if a deal can't be reached on NAFTA, he will terminate the agreement. A federal court has dismissed OceanX's challenge of subsidies given to Marine Atlantic. The privately owned OceanX asked the court to force the federal transport minister to reconsider the $94 million it provides to the ferry service between Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. OceanX argued that it can't offer a competitive freight service while its rival is being subsidized. But the provincial government countered that shipping rates and the cost of goods would increase without those subsidies. Okay, now before we get to the weather, because it's that time of the show, we have to tell you that uh, next week we're going to be starting 30 minutes later than usual. That is because we're the Olympic broadcaster and we'll bring you the Paralympic Games. We'll still be the same full hour show and we'll be on between 6.30 and 7.30 island time. And we'll have all the latest on St. John's Paralympian Liam Hickey, who's playing for... Team Canada, hockey, and uh, a wish that was years in the making. Have a look at this. I have another dream, so to, uh, I guess instead of Stanley Cup, is to go to the Paralympics and play for Team Canada men's team. That's uh, a younger Liam Hickey who had just started playing with the Sled Dogs. It was a men's sledge hockey team. Yeah, isn't that something to look yep. back? This Saturday, he'll be playing out that dream as part of Team Canada at the Paralympic Games in South Korea. Quite something, eh? That's so awesome. <laughs> to see him that young and wow. So yeah. you see, you can actually pursue your dreams. Also, he's, he's really interesting because in the winter we can talk about sledge hockey and then in the summer Paralympics we talk him 
talk to him about um, wheelchair basketball because he's on the men's national basketball team. I know. It's that's, amazing. Actually. That is amazing. Yeah. Awesome. I uh, yeah. can't wait for that. And of course, our coverage uh, next week uh, will be all over that. Now, uh, we'll be all over the weather situation next week as well, which uh, looks interesting. But we've got to get through the weekend, which uh, definitely looks interesting. Have a look at the weather map again. Uh, the Maritimes is being hit with that same storm that hit the northeastern parts of the U.S. yesterday. This not an issue for us. Blocking high over Labrador is keeping us shielded from this one, though we will see some very light snow across places like Port of Basque tomorrow and the winds picking up, especially late tomorrow. Uh, wind warnings have been prompted for the West Coast as well as Wreck House. Uh, by Friday morning, again, still some of those flakes along the Southwest Coast. Everybody else, it's a pretty quiet day. Some sun breaks in the mix. And then we get into the mess as we roll into the Friday night and Saturday morning time period. That's when that steadiest snow will push across the Avalon, St. John, mm -hmm. central parts of Newfoundland to Cornerbrook. And that will continue into the afternoon, though it will ease off as that main snow band will lift off to the north. As we roll into the Sunday time period, this low will be tracking to our south and we'll continue to see some lighter snow for most of Newfoundland, but a steady snow band looking set for somewhere along that north coast. That's still a little uncertain. We'll nail this down. We'll have a complete timeline for Saturday and more details on your forecast coming up in just a few minutes. Debbie and Anthony. Thanks very much to Ryan. Well, as uh, some of us know, navigating the streets of St. John's in a on a bike can be challenging. And some parts of the city, such as Allendale Road and Rollins Cross, which has been in the news of late, can be downright frightening on two wheels. And now a Memorial University professor is looking for ways to make cycling a little bit easier with an app. It's called bikemaps.org. It uses an interactive map of the St. John's area and asks cyclists to add incident reports of collisions, near misses, road hazards, and even bicycle thefts. Mon assistant professor Daniel Fuller says the data may be used to determine where cycling infrastructure should be built. He believes separated bike only lanes work best. The natural progression of these sorts of things in cities is um, you have some separated lanes, usually as, some, as a pilot project. Um, that pilot project tends to work better than people expected, uh, and then those lanes end up staying, and then you sort of build on your, in, your network from there. Um, so I, I can't say for sure that that's going to happen in St. John's, but that's the experience that we see in the research in lots of different cities. I noticed one thing missing from that report. What's that? No mention of a bike stolen from the CBC. <laughs> I'm laughing. It's but, too uh, soon, Debbie. No yeah. jokes. No <laughs> jokes. Okay. They're Team Guju's biggest fans, and we found them in Regina cheering on their team.
Brad Gucci's biggest fan for making a splash at the briar, affectionately dubbed Gucci's Girls. The six friends from Gander have traveled all the way to Regina, where they are hard to miss in the stands, and we've reached them at the rink. Well, Jeannie, uh, you're going to be speaking for the girls there. Uh, introduce us to your friends. Okie dokie. Well, I'm Jeannie. I'm the G. And then we have you, Alice, S, Lorna, O'Reilly, H, H, Betty, Hannah, U, Cindy, and E, e Nancy. <laughs> and I have to tell you that there are seven of us, but sadly, one of our number is ill this afternoon, Doris Johnston, a very important part of our group. We have a thumbs up sign, you see. Uh huh. So, how uh -huh. are things going so far? So far, so good. We're delighted. We're here. Uh, we're in the uh, final setup for the for the briar, and Brad is on the ice. So we're delighted. Yeah. You know, you're famous. Uh, your pictures are all over social media. <laughs> yeah, we're we were a little. We started this uh, two briars ago in Ottawa, and we were a little surprised at the reaction, but we're getting a little bit used to it. Yeah, and I understand you changed your shirt color to pink. It's very distinctive. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we, we kind of stand out like six little bottles of Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> now, I understand you are all uh, avid curlers yourselves. Yes, we all curl at the Gander Curling Club. We, we are great supporters of our ladies curling. So, Jeannie, how does this briar compare to past events? You said you were in Ottawa, and of course you were at mile one last year. How does this one compare? Well, to be absolutely truthful, Debbie, and I hope nobody around me hears me, nothing can compare to last year's briar <laughs> in St. John's. That was stupendous. But it's a great briar, as most briars out west are. Um, but as I say, nothing can touch, nothing can touch St. John's. Yeah. So, Jeannie, last night, uh, Guju played Greg Smith's team, an historic first for having two teams from this province. What was that like? Oh, that was absolutely wonderful. And we had a little problem because we had divided loyalties. So we <laughs> sort of handled it by switching shirts about each end. We would be Guju supporters one end and Team Newfoundland the next. We had green shirts for Newfoundland. True Newfoundlanders. <laughs> absolutely. With our tartan scarves and all. So the playoffs are just ahead. Uh, what are you all watching for next? What? What? Sorry, Debbie. Yay! Is Guju just taking to the ice? Well, th this is a particularly good shot that we had to cheer for. We're in the second end now of this draw. <laughs> So I just uh, will just conclude, uh, Jeannie, with what you guys are all looking forward to now. Well, naturally, we're looking forward to being here for the playoff game and Guju coming up on top and repeating last year's win. <laughs> well, thank you all, Guju's girls, for joining us. Your enthusiasm is infectious. Have a great rest of the briar. Well, thank you very much, Debbie, and goodbye from Regina. Go, 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 a terrifying situation falling through the ice, and it happens all too often in this province. Up next, an underwater rare look at what can happen and what you need to do to save yourself.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, it's been a tough winter here on the Avalon. Fickle temperatures, rain, freezing rain, not a whole lot of snow, not great for outdoor activities like ice fishing. Joining me now, Paul French, volunteer with the Rovers Search and Rescue. And um, you've seen a lot of action over the years out on the ice. You pull people out of the water. We're here now at Long Pond today. What are the ice conditions here, Paul? Uh, the ice conditions here on this particular pond today, as you can see here, I just took out a little chunk of ice just from uh, on shore here, and there's probably about two and a half to three inches of, of clear ice, what we would call now. It's still rotten ice, but uh, what we want people to remember is that this snow that's on top, it breaks away. It's, um, it's not ice, it's just snow. Uh, and when it do look like solid ice from, from above, uh, when you actually drill into a hole and check the ice thickness, this is what you're looking for from clear, solid, hard ice. Okay, so it's definitely not safe to be no, out there. No, the ice conditions here today are not safe. It's open up here behind us. There's uh, spots all across this pond, holes, rotten spots in, in the pond and in the river ways and outflows. Uh, it's, it's definitely not safe conditions here nor many other ponds across the province. What kind of calls have you gotten this winter? Uh, this year has been very busy, uh, not just for the rovers, but for the fire department here in town, uh, local fire department de detachments across the province and other SAR teams across the province. It's been very, very busy with uh, people going through the ice and, and near misses as well, so. Well, let's uh, talk about going through the ice. Now, CBC teamed up with you guys at the Rovers to do a demo video of what predicament somebody can get into. One of your volunteers actually jumped in the water for us a few times. Let's have our viewers have a look at it. We're out here today to uh, show people how to get out of the ice should they fall through. you go through the ice, the first reaction is uh, uh, to get your breathing under control. Once you go through the water, we want you to, to turn around and try to get out where it was you went in. That's the safest ice uh, that we know of. We know we walked across that and, and it gave out at that certain point. So if it held your weight on the way in, chances are it'll hold your weight on the way out. To really get out, you, you want to kick your feet as much as you can, get as much of your body weight up on top of that ice, and once you get up there, you just roll away as far as you can, stay low, stay uh, horizontal as far as you can, and get on the, on the dry land. In the second scenario, the gentleman actually had on a set of ice picks. What it is, they're uh, handles with uh, sharp ends on them, once you fall through, the ice is slippery and you have absolutely no grip. We always recommend for people to have ice picks and you really dig them into the ice and you can grab your way out. There's all different types, but basically it's just a pointed end and it really grips once you push them down into the ice. And these ice picks you can pick up at any outdoor store here around town. I also have a homemade pair here. Just two old screwdrivers that were bent up. I just cut them to a certain length, tie a little string on you. And that's where you're getting your, your grip to once you fall through the ice. In the third scenario, we had a, a friend that was nearby. He just grabbed an old dead tree that was laying down on the ground. He ran out so far, he got down on his belly, he spread his weight horizontal, got out as close as he could, we thought it was safe till he could reach him with the stick, and he gave him that as a grabbing device so that the person in the water can grab themselves out. And you can also help too, because you can pull them out. As long as they can get their hands on it, your buddy can pull you out. So Paul, what a fantastic look at the struggle that somebody goes through. Uh, what a predicament to be in. Yeah, it, it's, it's not very good. Um, when someone goes through the ice, I mean, it's the panic sets in, it's getting your breathing under control and getting back out of there. Um, you know, it happens, but we want people to remember the 110-1 principle. 
And what is that? So 110 Debbie is, it, is it's an analogy that we want everybody to remember. So you have one minute to control your breathing. You have 10 minutes of meaningful movement and one hour before hypothermia takes over. Uh, there's a myth out there that people believe you fall through the ice within a couple minutes, uh, you know, is going to end and what have you. Uh, and that's not the case. Uh, if you can get past the first minute, uh, keeping your head above water and get your breathing under control, you have a very good chance of getting out of there. The 10 minutes, if you don't feel you can get out of there within 10 minutes or, or shortly thereafter, we want you to stay put and conserve your energy. As you can see in the video, the gentleman was kicking his feet, he was exerting a lot of energy, there's a lot of cold water rushing up around his body, and you lose a lot more uh, body temperature from your body in the water than out of the water. So we want you to huddle up, uh, you know, get comfy, and get a hold of the ice, and, and stay up out of the water as much as you can and wait for help to arrive. Well, I always find that falling through days absolutely terrifying. There's some fantastic information there. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Right? It was very dramatic. Yeah. And uh, good on the fella who had to I keep know. going. How many times that poor <laughs> guy go in the through. water? He's yeah. wearing a wetsuit, but still. But it his head out. and everything went yeah. in. So, uh, By the way, I just wanted to add this. Paul worries that this weekend's snowfall that's mm -hmm. coming might lull people into a false sense of security. They want to get that one last snowmobile trip in or ice fishing, he says and stresses. Right. No pond in the province is safe yeah. right now. Don't be fooled by the snow. For mm. sure. Great stuff. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking we were going to roll the sting there, but that's my bad. <laughs> Thanks, guys, uh, for uh, uh, reminding me that there, there is no sting. Okay. So, uh, weather. The, uh, don't be fooled by the snow <laughs> was a segue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I trampled all over that and then backed over it with the car a couple times. Uh, now I'll get a stick and pull you out of the yeah, hole. Thank you, thank you. I need a snow shovel, please. Uh, okay, now as we take a look at the, let's start with the special weather statements and the, and the wind warnings that, that are in effect. Mention those off the top. There they are there. Uh, how about the winds that are going to be gusting for Burgio to Ramia, Port of Basque in the 100 to 110 region, uh, 80 to 100 from Port of Basque up to Corner Brook except the wreck house area that will gust up to 160 on Friday night and in through early Saturday morning. Winds are going to be ripping in through the wreck house region. Special weather statements still in effect for everybody except for the west coast where snowfall amounts are not going to be quite as high Thanks to those easterly winds with this uh, system coming in, you don't quite get that snow uh, that the rest of the island will be seeing. And not looking like warning criteria, which is 15 centimeters or more by the time we get to Saturday evening, but certainly uh, approaching that threshold by the time we get to the Saturday evening time period. Uh, here is how it will all play out. This is the low that again has been snowing itself out over the Maritimes and mixed terrain there. This one really won't be an issue for us, though, as we roll through Friday. Very, very quiet conditions. Winds, though, will be ramping up through the day along the west coast. Some gusts upwards of 80 kilometers per hour for exposed areas of the coast, even tomorrow morning. Uh, pretty quiet through most of Labrador. Cool start, minus 13 to 15 and minus 3 to minus 6 with mostly cloudy skies across the island for tomorrow. Those mostly cloudy skies continue into the afternoon. Winds now for the southwest coast already starting to approach 100 especially Cornerbrook South down towards Port of Basque and especially in the Wreck House region. Winds gusting, uh, picking up certainly through the day. Easterlies, uh, 50 to 60 kilometers per hour, especially towards the Buren Peninsula by the end of the day tomorrow. Watch your timeline. Here's Friday evening. Snow now underway for Port of Basque across to the Buren Peninsula and approaching the southern parts of the Avalon. After midnight arrival for St. John's, but before 3 a.m., that looks to be the time frame. This is where we'll see the heaviest snow bands here. You see those dark uh, blues? That's where we're really going to be seeing the heaviest snowfall through the early morning hours of Saturday. Winds, I think, will be a little bit stronger than what are projected here in the 60, even 70 kilometer per hour range across the Avalon Peninsula and even into uh, the Buren Peninsula region. And that snow by 5 a.m. tracking up towards Cornerbrook. There are those gusts very strong for the southwest coast. That snow continues through the morning. Any morning commute is going to be definitely a snowy one and a slick one with the snow uh, coming down at a pretty steady clip through the Saturday morning time period. As we roll into the afternoon, 
that snow will start to lift to the north. Looks like after or in or around the lunchtime hour, uh, definitely has changed to drizzle for St. John's and the Avalon down towards the Buren Peninsula. The light snow continues across central parts of Newfoundland. At times a little on the steady side, no question about that. And then as we roll into the Saturday night time period, well, that snow will continue for the north coast and we'll show you that in just a second. There are your temperatures again rising above zero for the southeast with that mix to drizzle. 10 to 15 centimeters of snow before that mix to drizzle. Looks like 10 to as much as 15 centimeters, especially along the, the north coast. A little bit lighter down towards Buckins, the Humber Valley and the West Coast, where I think amounts uh, will be closer to five centimeters here and a trace to five centimeters up towards the Northern Peninsula. This is through Saturday evening. And again, as I mentioned, for Sunday, the snow is going to continue, but where it tracks on Sunday is a little more or less certain. There will be a snow band set up to the north, but whether it's over the northern peninsula with the north coast, still a little uncertain. And as this low tracks to our south, could see some additional light snow across even central and eastern Newfoundland on Sunday. But again, a little less certain as to where exactly those snow bands will set up, but amounts should be uh, less than uh, 10 centimeters in most of these areas, but the potential for 10 to 15 or a little bit more along the north coast. We'll talk more about that with your long range forecast coming up. An aquaculture accident prompts another state in the U.S. to ban open pen salmon farming. Big news in the world of salmon aquaculture. The state of Washington has moved to ban net pen fish farming of Atlantic salmon. This after a salmon cage collapsed and 250,000 fish escaped. Washington's target is a Canadian company, Cook Aquaculture. Here in this province where Cook has operations, a judge forced the government to conduct an environmental review into a large aquaculture project conceived by Grieg International. That one's for Placentia Bay. As one jurisdiction bans net pen operations, the government here is keen to approve putting more salmon cages here. For his perspective on this, I'm joined by Neville Crabb. He's the Director of Communications for the Atlantic Salmon Federation. Welcome to Here and Now. Thank you very much. Well, could you briefly explain the significance of, of what's happened in Washington State? Well, Washington now joins with California, Oregon and Alaska as jurisdictions that will no longer permit open net pen salmon farming. Uh, it's clearly a significant development for the state itself, for the company involved, and really for the industry overall. And I think 
what it shows is when a company fails its basic duty, in this case to keep its fish contained and loses the trust of the public, there can be uh, severe ramifications. So how did Cook lose the trust of the public in Washington State? Well, the, the number of fish that escaped is actually up to 263,000. Wow. And a state investigation by three agencies found that uh, by failing to clean the nets, the company let 110 tons of mussels and other aquatic organisms build up. Um, in July of last year, about a month before the total collapse, the cage itself was actually picked up and moved by tides, breaking uh, 10 moorings free. At that time, it would have been possible to avert this whole um, political and environmental disaster by harvesting the fish early. It didn't happen. Um, I think in the aftermath of that and with the results of the state's investigation, there was, no, uh, there was no public trust left in Washington for the industry. So does this decision in the United States, and Washington in particular, to, to ban uh, this kind of aquaculture, does that have any kind of ripple effect into our country? I think it should have a ripple effect for uh, governments in Atlantic Canada. Um, the Atlantic Salmon Federation is not calling for an outright ban of the industry here. That's not really practical or realistic given our current political climate, but we can do a lot better. There's growing awareness of the negative effects and risk that the industry brings. There's growing public criticism of it. And I think that governments could introduce more transparency, more accountability here. I mean, we're constantly asking our public governments to be transparent and accountable. Right. And I believe it's fair to ask the same of companies operating in our public waters. As I mentioned in the introduction, Grieg has a major proposal to operate a large fish farm with many cages here in Placentia Bay. What should lawmakers in Newfoundland and Labrador conclude about this, this ban in Washington? I think people are, are paying attention and it's partly that rising awareness that's led to the situation we have now uh, with Grieg. As you mentioned, it took a judge to order it, but ultimately the Newfoundland government has done what no Atlantic Canadian government has done before, and that's to order a full environmental assessment of this project. Actually, the, the public meeting on it is going to be held next week. It's, it's a step, I think, in um, showing the public what's involved here bringing in public's opinion and ultimately making uh, incremental and realistic improvements to the way the industry operates in our coastal waters of Atlantic Canada. Mm -hmm. And obviously the government's got this big decision to make about how many jobs it creates, so there's tension, but we'll certainly pay attention to that public hearing in Marystown that you uh, mentioned there uh, next week. Um, Mr. Crabb, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome, thank you. So Anthony, uh, this event in Marystown is not part of the environmental yeah, review? Yeah, that's right, Debbie. It sort of happens before. This is basically in anticipation of that. So it's a public information session where Grieg, I, my understanding is they're bringing in some experts from around the world and they're going to present and explain their project and try to answer questions. So that's a Tuesday, as you saw, 7 p.m. at uh, St. Gabriel's Hall in Marystown. She was 24 years old. Coming up, more on our province's missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls.
Welcome back, and it's time now to shine the spotlight on a local young athlete. This is 16-year-old Nathan Fleet. Comes to us from Ghouls, and he sure hits the bullseye with his favorite sport. Yes, Nathan, may the odds forever be in your favor to give you a little Hunger Games. He's an archer who's competed at a national level, winning over 52 medals across Canada. Wow. And uh, keep making your mark, Nathan. Congratulations on your achievements and for being chosen as today's Young Athlete of the Day. The weather update is brought to you by Bell Tone Hearing Service St. John's, helping the world hear better. Okay, well, we want to hear more about what's coming. Yes, before we get the, to that, though, we had some visitors. Uh, we did. Here today. They were up oh, in yeah. the newsroom, and then you kindly had them here yeah. in the studio. Let's Very have nice a look. People. Yeah. So, of course, the studio and the green wall were the big hit for the kind and great folks at uh, Vera Perlin. Uh, a great group of folks who uh, loved the newsroom, yes. but I think they loved the studio and the green wall more, don't you yeah, think? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And there's a couple of uh, big weather geeks in the group here. <laughs> uh, apparently, yeah, I see one in the back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, apparently, weather is a topic of conversation uh, at every gathering. And of course, some of them were asking. There's a big bowlathon happening on Sunday, okay. um, and uh, I assured them that the weather was not going to be an impact for them on Sunday. So that's uh, some good news. Yeah, there. Really nice great. people. They yeah. sort of bumped into them upstairs in the mm. newsroom. So it was great meeting you. Yeah, uh, always great to have uh, visitors here through the studio and uh, and touring the building. So uh, thanks uh, to uh, K Katie Rowe who hooked that up, and of John Gushu who walked them through as well. Okay, so weather forecast time and have a look. Uh, this is the system that, again, has been tracking through the Maritimes that won't be a factor for us as an area of high pressure holds strong and a pretty good looking Friday. If you have some Friday travel plans, it's a new low that develops uh, within the uh, uh, within the borders of this first load that uh, dissipates over the Maritimes. And here comes our, our weather maker. Winds ramping up, as we mentioned. Rec House will gust to 160 Friday night in through Saturday morning. Gusts up to 100 kilometers per hour for the southwest coast, uh, as well as the west coast of the island south of Cornerbrook. Wind warnings are in effect. Saturday morning travel certainly impacted uh, right across the island from the Avalon to Cornerbrook into the afternoon. Certainly better travel as we mix to drizzle for the Avalon and the Buren Peninsulas. Uh, lighter snows certainly into the latter half of the afternoon into the evening for central western parts of Newfoundland and up towards the northern peninsula. In case you missed it, this is what we are looking at in terms of snowfall projections. Lighter amounts along the west coast thanks to those easterly winds. Bit of a down sloping effect there. Uh, do think that uh, 10 to as much as 15 centimeters certainly through Saturday evening and the best chance of that certainly looks to be towards the Baybert Peninsula and down towards White Bay and then across to Bonavista North as that band kind of stalls out there through the later parts of the day and really that band is going to be the central focus for Sunday and where exactly it sets up. Uh, it does look like it'll be somewhere along the north coast but whether it dips down into central through Sunday or waits till Monday is still uh, remains to be seen. It does look like we'll see some snow right through Monday. Remember yesterday I was talking about a coastal system Tuesday into Wednesday. Latest forecast models starting to pull that further east. That would then allow for a Thursday into Friday system. However, I still have that snow in my forecast for Tuesday into Wednesday though. Want to see at least uh, two runs in a row that have that idea. So right now uh, just a, a little bit of an asterisk there on that Tuesday Wednesday forecast, but certainly uh, quiet through Labrador, even with that uh, change in the forecast potentially. Looks very quiet there for the next seven days. Debbie and Anthony. Thanks again, Ryan. Returning now to Happy Valley Goose Bay. It was the second and final day of the testimony at the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Earlier, Peter Cowan introduced us to a young woman who lost her mother at age six. Mary Evans Harlick, an Inuit woman from Northwest River, was strangled in 2002. And her daughter, Amina, traveled from St. John's to give this testimony today. She always had a really kind heart. And she made sure that me and my brother had the best life that we could. And made sure that we were always happy. She would, um, she used to bring me to the store and get me caramel squares. And now they're my favorite snacks. Um, we used to make Rice Krispie squares, and whew, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, she used to 
and hide toys around her house as a little surprise. So there was dinosaurs under the couch one time and snow pants on top of her lamp and everything. And she, she made sure that the time we had with her was special. She was 24 years old. And at the time that she was murdered, how old were you? I was six years old and my brother was five years old. I, I remember this clear as day. Um, there was one day that my father had asked me and my brother to come into the room because he wanted to talk to us. And I knew that it was kind of going to be a little harsh. I could just kind of sense it. So I ran and grabbed a toy from um, my bedroom uh, that she had given me. And we came into the room and he said that, um, mom, will, we won't be seeing mom anymore. Um, she, had, she had passed away and you won't be able to see her. When I got older, I was able to do a little bit of research and my family would tell me that um, the night that it happened, she was um, at a friend's house and she wanted to go home or something like that. And um, she threatened to call the police because this man wouldn't let her leave. And he kind of freaked out because he had a warrant for his arrest in Ontario. So he, in a article and an interview that he did, he said that he punched her in the face and then uh, it all snowballed and he said, well, now I'm gonna have to kill her. So um, he strangled her with her um, rawhide necklace and then put her in a sleeping bag and then put her underneath a, um, a crawl space under the stairs. I'm interested to see our photo of the day. That's yeah. right, and then a curling update, right? Yes. So okay. make sure we uh, get the photo in first. Have a look. This is a beautiful one taken along the west uh, coast of the island. Wow. Not, I know, hard to uh, guess, given that there's not a lot of terrain mm. in that picture, but I uh, wanted to show the picture first, and then we'll zoom into beautiful St. Paul's along the west coast, uh, in just uh, in the Cowhead area, and a beautiful shot there. 
taken by Saffron Bennett. Yep, one of the uh, first iceberg tourists to get to uh, the island uh, this year is right there in that picture. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Those are magnificent animals. It, it, I, the way it's backlit in our small monitor here, I guess I'm correct in saying it's a caribou. Yes, it is a yeah. caribou. Yeah. yeah. Good eyes, Debbie Cooper. G yeah, well, really. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Saffron, thank you very much. Uh, we, do, we did just get an update. Uh, the Briar, uh, of course, Team Canada, Team Guzu. Yes. Right. Uh, they are in Regina, and uh, he has, he and they have just won the game against oh, Manitoba 5 2. Nice. They were leading 5 1. I guess Manitoba made a bit Managed of a comeback, one. but yeah. uh, anyway. There we go. All right. Great. So fantastic. Uh, onward. Yeah. You're doing great. <laughs> you have to wear your pink shirt tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> go, because you go. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to be away tomorrow. That's oh. a good reminder. Carolyn Stokes will be okay. here for me. Right. And I'll be back on Taking Monday. Taking the briar, a few beers, that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Not anything okay. as pleasant as that. <laughs> All right. We'll see you on Monday. Okay. Have a great yeah. evening, everyone. Take see care. You.